six. This is episode two of the History of Podcast. I'm Robert. And I'm Emma. And today we are discussing the history of golf. But first, we have to do the egg carton count. We even have our, our own little bell. Today's egg carton count is... Six. Six egg cartons. And yes. for those who don't know, it's uh, dampening for our recording. Three fell off the wall. Two or three fell off the wall. So, yeah, that's why our egg carton count went down, but we are fixing that, and our egg carton count will go up momentarily, or soon, or whenever the next episode comes out. Uh, But today, we are discussing the history of golf, and uh, a lot of us blame our lacking ability in golf on the notion that it's 10% skill and 90% luck. Well, that's just an excuse for us being bad at golf, but that's probably (laughs) not true. For thousands of years, golf has taken many forms and undergone several changes. For a long time, it never had any official rules, yet today, competitions are closely monitored by entities like the United States Golf Association and the Professional Golfers Association. Nevertheless, golf has been a favorite sport among numerous nations and cultures and can still be enjoyed to this day. Uh, The earliest known form of golf was seen painted on the walls of an Egyptian tomb in circa 2600 BC, uh, and the painting depicts two players swinging at a round figure on the ground. Uh, Unfortunately, this image is quite vague, and it may have represented something more closely uh, related to field hockey than golf. The painting is actually of two people holding sticks, batting a ring on the ground, so maybe it was something like golf, something like field hockey. Um, I've seen actually um Appalachian games uh where children would uh like bounce a ring. Have you seen that game where there's a there's a ring and then they keep it going with a stick? That's not golf. It's more like a hoop and So but the the picture's so vague it could even be something like that. Maybe. A similar stick and ball activity may have been carried over to ancient Greece, as it is shown in a Greek engraving from circa thirteen hundred BC. Even the Romans uh, played a game called, and I'm going to butcher this, uh, Paganicus. <laughs> pa- Paganicus. I think it's Paganicus. Paganicus, which involved hitting specified targets uh, with about a five inch wide hollow leather ball and a hockey like bent wooden stick. And so, how how this would work would say uh, is would say uh, two people have their sticks in a ball and. Um, Say there's a tree. Oh, I can. Who can hit that tree over there in the least amount of shots? And that's kind of how it would work. Interestingly, the known history of golf went silent until the sport, along with soccer, was banned by King James II of Scotland in 14, 1457. 1457. <laughs> Even though golf was played primarily by the upper class, uh, it was still considered a distraction from learning archery as military training for uh, for war, for battle against England. The Scottish national ban on golf was not lifted until 1502 by the order of King James IV. By this time, the Treaty of Glasgow, a.k.a. the Treaty of Perpetual Peace, has been signed between Scotland and England. Uh, King James IV uh, had even become an avid golfer himself. I read an article actually stating that he had he had bought golf clubs and a golf bag, possibly. Wow. I don't know if he used them, but he had them. Quite bougie, quite bougie. <laughs> Nevertheless, throughout this time, the rules and regulations of golf were not set in stone. It was not until 1744 that the first known recording of the modern rules of golf was published. The first set of rules was called Articles and Laws in Playing at Golf. Sounds very fancy and was written for the Leith Lynx golf course in Edinburgh, Scotland. And yeah, Lynx is another name for course or golf course, uh, so you can just replace that word in your brain. But articles and laws and playing at golf. Uh, and so here are a couple of the rules. For example, rule one, your tee must be within a, ball, within a club's length of the hole. Rule two, 
Your tea must be upon the ground. I would hope so. Rule 11. If you draw your club in order to strike and proceed so far in the stroke as to be bringing down your club, if then your club shall break in any way, it is accounted a stroke. Can we take a moment and appreciate how much effort that would take for your club to break? I mean, I don't know exactly what their clubs were made of. This is true. They might not have been that durable if that was a problem. Maybe they just had anger issues. I, I don't know. We can't go through this episode on golf without mentioning the beloved golf clap. Where does that pleasant patter signature to golf come from? Well, uh, the first rule regarding being quiet while golf was being played was written in the uh, Ab- Aberdeen Code of 1783. Uh, it states, quote, While a stroke is playing, no one of the party shall walk about, make any motion, or attempt to take off the player's attention by speaking or otherwise. As a result, the golf clap arose as an alternative to boisterous cheering. Interestingly, the Ryder Cup golf tournament goes beyond the mere golf clap and promotes enthusiastic applause. And briefly, I will mention that that one, what was it, that one rule doesn't directly address the golf clap. It's more, it goes directly towards making noise as a whole, the Mm -hmm. whole tradition of being quiet. I find it interesting how even the announcers for a game of golf or like when whenever you watch something like um, any sort of golf tournament you'll see the announcers in a studio somewhere else are still whispering even though it doesn't matter because they're in a studio somewhere else I don't know you that's can just... tell that's his a uh, big pet peeve well I have I have other pet peeves <laughs> and uh, it's necessary to mention at this point that the holy grail of golf courses or links is St. Andrews in Fife, Scotland, uh, and Leith Links, uh, where those rules were created, uh, is not far behind. Transitioning from the historic golf rules to modern-day golf rules, throughout the years, the rules and regulations of golf have increased in both number and specificity to the point of having a 191-page rulebook of small print governed by entities like the United States Golf Association, USGA, and RNA Rules Limited. Yeah, that one uh, rule book that I looked up was created by those two entities, and yeah, it's 191 pages. Every aspect is covered, um, everything you can possibly think of. This ranges all the way from a player being allowed to practice on a competition course before starting, to pen- penalties for unfairly playing out of turn. A player is even disqualified if he submits a better score than he actually made. However, if you submit a worse score than you actually made, you keep that score. I guess you kind of ask for it if you do that. Mm -hmm. Uh, And notice that we are avoiding saying, quote, lower score, uh, because that means something completely different, as we will discuss in a moment. As you may know, each hole on a golf course has a set par. The par is the estimated number of strokes an average golfer would take to get to the hole. Your score is how many strokes you've taken above or below par. For example, in a pro golf tournament, you may see people with scores of negative 17 or negative 18. That means that over the course of the 18 holes, they've added up to 17 or 18 below each par. And this would be, this style of play would be something called stroke play. However, there is a different competition format called match play, and I found an explanation of this on Olympic.org, the Olympic.org website, because I think the way they explained match play was just better than anything that I could possibly restate. So, uh, quote, match play is a competition format in the form of a duel. Golfers complete hole by hole, compete hole by hole, and the golfer who wins the most holes wins the match. Match play matches do not have to go the full 18 holes. They often do, but just as frequently, one player will achieve an insurmountable lead to the match, uh, and the match will end entirely. For example, if a player is six ahead with five holes to play, the other player cannot possibly win, so the match ends. As far as governing authorities for the sport of golf, on December 22nd, 
1894, the Amateur Golf Association of the United States was created in response to the Newport Golf Club in Rhode Island and St. Andrews Golf Club in Yonkers, New York, each hosting what they declared was the Amateur National Championship. This group is now known as the United States Golf Association, or the USGA. And the Professional Golfers Association, uh, which many of us also know as, or more well know as, the PGA, was created on January 17th, uh, 1916. And the association was sponsored by Lewis Rodman uh, Wanamaker. Wanamaker? Yeah, Wanamaker, I believe. And of Wanamaker Department Stores, uh, which became part of Macy's Department Stores as of 2005. So that's an interesting piece of trivia you can tell all your friends, bore all your friends with. Uh, but this was to spur enthusiasm for golf. Golfers in the association annually uh, compete for the Wanamaker Trophy, which is, quote, one of golf's most prestigious awards. And I need to mention, at this point, a huge pet peeve of mine. Oftentimes, when someone says, when someone wants to say something that is really bad, they say it's subpar. I've seen someone say, oh, this coffee is subpar. Well, what they really want to say is, if something's bad, is that it's above par. Because when they say that, they're getting it backwards. So, when you want to say something is really good, say that it's above par. Please do not get it wrong. Because to say that is to make a golf reference and to get it incorrect. Anyway, about the Olympics. Golf was included in the 1900 Paris Olympics and the 1904 Paris Olympics, excluded for over 100 years until its reappearance in Rio 2016. One last thing before we go is the origin of the term for. Uh, you've more likely than not heard of this as a warning uh, directed towards people ahead of you on the golf course. If you drive the ball and it starts heading their way or starts heading, you know, someone starts heading towards someone further down the course, you might want to yell for to, to warn them. And there are two primary explanations for how this came about. The first is more likely to be true than the second, but we'll just dive into those two explanations. The first explanation goes back to 1681 with the term called the four caddy, first known to be used by the Duke of York. Remember, golf was really only for the filthy rich back then. The four caddy is just the same as a caddy today. However, the inclusion of the four at the beginning refers to the fact that these caddies would often go ahead of the golfer. Exclaiming four may just have been a shorter way to say four caddy. Yeah, so they're just warning their four caddy who was ahead. And the second explanation has trouble connecting itself to golf. That's why it's a lot weaker than the first. But in essence, it's a battlefield warning for soldiers up ahead. Uh, when the people in the back fired their muskets, uh, they may have yelled for to warn those in front of them to keep their heads down. And this makes sense um, when trying to connect it. Wow, my, my dad's mowing right now. And you can hear it. And we're going to leave this in. But anyway, uh, this, this yelling for actually goes all the way back to John Knox in a really squirrely way. Uh, but we won't get into all that because that would get into a very long show no matter how much the sport is skill and how much is luck we can all appreciate the timeless longevity of golf it has been a favorite among numerous nations and cultures from the egyptians to the greeks to the romans to the scots the game has only established a firmer foothold on society golf has taken many steps to become what it is today and it would require many more to make it go away if you have any questions or comments about the information provided in this episode, please contact us at thehistoryof365 at gmail.com. Have a blessed day and never stop learning.